One of the first people I had a chance to talk to as we were beginning to plot this whole thing, uh, I found out that NYU recently got a whole division on medical ethics, which you're looking at right here. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur Kaplan and I, and, and he said, well, why don't, I, why don't I do a thing proposing that all medical research, starting with the National Institutes for Health, uh, be abolished, be suspended, uh, let's get pharmaceuticals in there too, and my first question to him is, you're a medical ethicist? <laughs> but, but, uh, but actually, as a thought experiment, it, it raises all sorts of interesting and important issues. And uh, so originally, I should say, by the way, that this was going to be a debate between him and a friend of his who was a, uh, uh, a high-level phar uh, pharmacy medical research executive. And that person proved unable to be part of this. And that in itself is kind of interesting. Um, but maybe you have some thoughts on that, and, and in any case... Uh, right. He will be eliminated. It doesn't matter. Okay, so there you go. He, he's the first... <laughs> exactly. You're, you're, that, maybe that was the problem. He just didn't want to talk about his own exactly. job. Anyway, but here I give you the, the, the ethical view of things, which is let's just get rid of all these researchers altogether. Arthur Kaplan. So thank you, Ren. And thanks, everybody, who's helped uh, organize this day. It's been a very interesting... Uh, set of sessions. I, too, couldn't be here in the morning. I had to do a uh, talk on something that represents the worst of uh, what my little Swiftian argument is here today. It was a meeting on mapping the brain. Some of you know there's been a new announcement to map the brain uh, at uh, probably a cost of about $3 billion. I can promise you that the only reason anybody would spend money on mapping the brain is to hope to get after interventions that would help with traumatic brain injury or Alzheimer's or Parkinsonism or other diseases. So the notion is, let's do with the brain what we've done with the genome and let's pursue uh, interventions, therapies, diagnostic tests um, that will get us healthier. Um, so I am going to make the case that we should not map the brain and we shouldn't spend anything on anything anymore, at least for a while. I didn't say ban it forever. I said suspend funding. And I do admit I'm being Swiftian in the argument, but it's partly to bring out certain highlights about uh, the challenge we face, uh, particularly in the United States, with the high cost of health care, not just in how we die, although dying plays a, big, plays a big part in that. Certainly aging plays a big part in that. You're talking about the two big consumer groups for uh, health resources in the United States, the dying and the aging. They are absolutely the champions of healthcare consumption. So uh, why would I think we have to stop research? What I'll try to argue, I won't keep you in suspense, the argument goes something like this. We're spending a pile of money. Demographics indicate that no matter what we do, we're going to be spending a lot more money. Some people say we can chug along happily by uh, getting rid of fraud and waste in the system, of which there's an enormous amount. I will try to argue that that is utopian at best. One person's fraud is another person's paycheck. <laughs> and that turns out to be very true in healthcare, by the way. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to make that work. Another way we can get a handle on our crazy escalating expenditures is to use science, particularly evidence-based medicine and comparative evidence research, which is a big buzzword at the medical center where I am, to help guide us make better, more rational decisions about what to reimburse and what to pay for. I will uh, show you actually uh, Judy said this before, but there ain't no rationality in what we pay for. And if you think that's going to work your way out of this cost explosion, forget it. And that will be the easiest thing to demonstrate to you since <clears throat> just in the past couple of years, right up to today, we have many illustrations of our inability to use evidence to rein in anything <laughs> in healthcare. Nothing. I mean, nothing. So we can't get a handle on eliminating the wasteful parts, the fraudulent parts. We can't get a handle on the evidence to rein in cost. If we don't rein in cost, it'll consume everything. 
If we don't rein in costs, we'll have no schools, roads, recreation, nothing. We'll just be spending money on drugs, devices, nursing homes, sick use, futuristic brain implants, and other odds and ends. But we won't have anything else around because all of our money will be going into this sector. We don't seem to be able to say no to anything, either at the bedside or in Washington or anywhere else. So the only hope is to stop the madness and suspend the research funding. It's the only hope we have. We can't say no when it's there. When they want to put the LVAD into you, you say, but it's my dad. I got to give him everything. When Congress gets asked, um, shouldn't we fund whatever initiative it is to save a lot of people, particularly old people, particularly old male people, they <laughs> look around and say, yes, we should <laughs> save ourselves um, at any price. That would be good. Um, if it doesn't exist, there's a chance we wouldn't, therefore, have to worry about whether to pay for it. The fastest way not to worry about paying for things that are tipping us over completely is to not let them come into existence. So I say, it's only 20 billion at the NIH. The way to stop having to worry about what to do with the next generation of marginally useful drugs that cost millions is to not fund them. The way to stop problems of the pharmaceutical industry generating up demand is to not tax subsidize their research. Now, you probably can't stop a private entity or person from doing research with private money. I might propose, if I was really in a foul mood, <laughs> that it would make Martha look happy, um, to, to arrest those people before they kill again. But I'm not going to go that far. Uh, but if we pulled the public side out, I think we could slow down the research engine that we've all been duped, misled, uh, into loving. And I say this at a talk here. Of course, I could never give this talk up at the medical school campus. <laughs> really never give this talk at the medical school campus. Um, since uh, <laughs> right here, I would never give this talk at the, <laughs> at the medical school campus because uh, we make a living in part off of clinical trials and uh, research projects that are funded by the uh, thing I'm talking about closely. But keep in mind, Dean, this was only a Swiftian argument. <laughs> so I do have some notes here, which I normally don't use, but the numbers are so thrilling. And since our social science friends insist that us ethicists must pay attention to the world and not just Babylon with normative arguments that we make up in our shower. <laughs> so here are some numbers. We today spend the equivalent of the gross national product of France on health care, the US. In the last 10 years, US spending on health care doubled from 1.3 trillion to 2.6 trillion a year. Figure is expected to reach 4.6 trillion by 2020, at which point per capita spending on health care will exceed $15,000 per person per year, taking us past, by the way, the poverty level of a large number of people in the society. Today, healthcare accounts for 18 cents of every dollar that we spend. Even with health reform moving, that number is expected to continue to grow. And indeed, if nothing is done, healthcare threatens, and this isn't my quote, it's the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, to consume the entire economy. Drug prices, about a third of a trillion go in the United States right now to drugs alone. Um, there are certainly uh, uh, reasons to think that we have slowed our spending on drugs. I don't know if you noticed, but this year we actually, for the first time, only had a 1% increase in drug expenditure, both Medicare Part D and the whole uh, total expenditure. But what's happening in the background is that specialty pharmaceuticals, meaning bioengineered drugs, not generics, not things like Lipitor uh, to, uh, for uh, a statin to control uh, cholesterol, behind the current generation of drugs are coming a very expensive set of new drugs, and they are expected to drive up drug costs, just that sector, enormously. Uh, 
Even if only a handful of patients need them, said Judith Clark, the pharmacy director for the Mississippi Medicaid program, if we don't do something quickly, our budgets are going to be blown out of the water. So the state Medicaid programs are freaked out just by drug expenditure. They don't know what to do. Um, let's see what other grim numbers I have here. Oh, this is, if the rising cost of specialty drugs is not at the top of your list of healthcare concerns, it ought to be. Specialty drugs currently account for 17%, these are the bioengineered ones, of the average employer's overall pharmacy costs. One of the nation's largest pharmacy benefit management companies, Express Scripts, projects that specialty drug costs will increase annually 20% per year over the next three years. Uh, an industry report suggests that specialty pharma costs may account for 40% of all total drug spend by 2020. That is why, by the way, uh, the pharmaceutical industry is not, despite the absence of my debate partner throwing itself off bridges or ending its life, because it knows that it stands to make a lot of money on, bio, on the next generation of genetically engineered, bioengineered drugs. It's going to be able to sell them at very high prices. It also hopes to personalize your medicine. You've all heard that we're, we've mapped the genome, so we're starting to design drugs so that it, they fit better your biology. So if you had a side effect from Vioxx, maybe we could make Vioxx B that would be fit to your genotype and you wouldn't have an adverse event. Some of you know that Coumadin or Warfarin is a difficult drug to manage. It's clearly got a biological link. It's metabolized differently in different people. If you could fine tune that drug, you could have fewer adverse events and more benefit. Indeed, FDA approved drugs, when you put them out in the general population as a general statement, probably work about 70% of the time, meaning 30% of people on average don't respond to whatever drug is out there. That's clearly just biological. You can try to find genetically engineered versions that will be elicit more of a biological response or screen people to see who's not a responder. Does everybody follow that? And everything I just said has been touted as things that will save us money. <laughs> there ain't no money going to be saved there. Those are all going to be charged at higher prices. If I can say to you, I have a safer, more effective drug that's personalized for your use, but I think I'll charge you less for it, I'm going to be saying that from an institutional setting. <laughs> so I don't believe that personalized medicine, while bringing some benefits, is going to make things cheaper. So everybody with me now? We're, this is grim economics, Malthusian, prices up, aging, living longer, demographics bad. <laughs> Demand up, I, I didn't give you this number, but roughly the number that you all hear about, it's a third of Medicare goes to people in the last six months of life. You have more old people, you're gonna have more public expenditure within the program, but forget that program, just look at the consumption of people who are older. They are the main users of healthcare. Somewhere here I have the number, I'll find it eventually, oh here it is. Uh, the proportion of the population aged 65 over 65 is projected to increase from the 12% it was in 2000 to 20% in 2030. There are so many old people running around with it. They're happy people or engaged people or I don't know what they are. Postmodern Post -modern people. That uh, the poor guy, what was his name, Willard Scott on the Today Show can't even mention the people over 100 anymore because there's not enough time to name them anymore. So we've given up on that. It's not even remarkable. It's just sort of, eh, you know, 100, meh. Um, my dad's 92. My mom are not, is 90. They live in the house I grew up in Boston. They're engaged, active, elderly, aging persons. They also would find this talk reprehensible. But... <laughs> <laughs> but they uh, certainly uh, represent a kind of cutting edge use. And some of us will say, uh, well, you know, one thing we ought to do, particularly in Obamacare, is have more prevention, right? We want to swing the system away from expensive therapies 
toward preventing things. And that sounds great, except it's totally wrong. All you achieve by preventing earlier deaths is more people with Alzheimer's, nursing home demands, and a broader demand ultimately on the healthcare system budget. If you want to save money, you want to encourage smoking. <laughs> you want to encourage speeding. You want to encourage no airbags, no helmets, more bikes in New York City streets. These are, these are your road to savings, not prevention. If you lower everybody's cholesterol and everybody has lower blood pressure and they stagger on to their 90s, their fate still is to be demanding on the healthcare system, maybe not at 62, but now at 94. But they're still there costing things. So you've jumped the shark a little bit, you pushed out your expenditures, but you don't save them ultimately by prevention. I'm not against you know, the healthier life that might occur due to prevention, but it is not your cost containment solution. Having more people live to old age, unless we can achieve this uh, sudden uh, compaction in the uh, age span of you live vigorously and then die in your sleep, which I'm not sure that that can be achieved in any way other than an active euthanasia program, because I don't know why you would be living healthy and then drop dead. But um, <laughs> nonetheless, don't get warmed up about prevention either. I don't want to hear about it. It doesn't <laughs> save any money. So here's. Uh, we got uh, chronic diseases, and by the way, <laughs> while I'm at it here, I, I, this wasn't part of my talk, but I have to point out, this notion that you do crossword puzzles and Sudoku and your brain is a muscle and you avoid Alzheimer's and other mental deficiencies by practicing, th that could only be funded by the crossword industry. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what the pharmaceutical industry is funding, but there are no reliable studies that say if you wake, every, wake up every day and do a math crossword puzzle, Alzheimer's is put off. It isn't. It's, it's got nothing to do with it. In fact, Alzheimer's, 10% of adults over 65 suffer for, from it. 47% of adults over 85 suffer from it, whether they do crossword puzzles or not. So what I'm telling you is, um, at that end of the spectrum, the notion that we're going to be able to uh, put off, stave off, or, or eliminate um, these kinds of expenditures in an aging society is just, it doesn't make any sense at all. That is not going to save us money. These people, a good number of them, if they really do control their blood pressure and don't smoke and lead other healthy things, will reach Alzheimer's and they will cost a lot of money. That's where prevention hits the high expense on that end. So um, you have many, many reasons to be uh, grim about where we're headed. Now, remember I said, let's get rid of the fraud and let's get rid of the waste. My friend and uh, the person who now has a position at uh, Penn, Zeke Emanuel, is a big believer that we can afford to move forward and continue to do research and discover new things in healthcare because we can weed out the fraud and the waste. Let me say, we've been trying for 40 years to weed out the fraud and the waste. Do any of you know actually how we prosecute fraud, say, in Medicaid? All Medicaid bills are paid. And what you then have to do is go after the fraud perpetrator and get a conviction in which, at which point the money will be returned. But we don't say, ooh, that looks like a fraudulent claim. We're not paying out the money. So by the time you start chasing down people for fraud in Medicare or Medicaid billing, of which there's a significant amount, they're gone, they've left, they've run away, they've stashed it in the proverbial Cayman Islands next to Mitt Romney's old bank account. <laughs> Wherever it was, they are very difficult to prosecute. We, we, no matter our best efforts, <clears throat> we have probably been able to return about 10% of fraud. Waste, it's there. We have a lot of inefficiencies in the healthcare system, but it is very difficult to weed them out. For example, a lot of talk about electronic medical records. They are associated with a lot of inefficiency, a lot of talk about billing departments. 
we're still going to have plenty of billing departments after health reform because we didn't get rid of private insurance. There's going to be a lot of money spent on administrative overhead. The country seems unable to ever get rid of market response to the distribution of health care. It's, it's expanding its, so to speak, social benefit safety net side, but it didn't get rid of this wasteful administrative cost. Similarly, it sounds great to have uh, an electronic uh, solution to some of our information exchange, but the notion that Americans have about putting a chip in their arm that would tell what their blood type is or what they're allergic to is one step away from the government is beaming messages in to that chip. They hate the notion of doing things that are efficient and cost saving relative to their privacy concerns and distrust of corporations and government relative to what you really should get out of a fully electronic information system. Or to say this more bluntly, we are not going to work our way out of this cost disaster by waste and uh, fraud recovery, pipe dream. How about evidence? All right, so let's spend a minute on evidence here. Uh, we had a panel form uh, back in, uh, I guess it was 2010. Let's see if I get the date here. The uh, US Preventative Service Task Force evaluated mammograms. Remember this happy day? Issued a report, said women age 40 to 50 should not get regular mammograms. You should get a baseline maybe at 40, but then you don't need to start them regularly until 50. This is a very nice panel full of very nice people, independent people. They're not mammogram operators. They're not people who care one way or the other whether these things get done from a financial point of view an independent group of blue ribbon type folks who uh, looked at mammograms and said, you know, you get exposed to more radiation if you get these annual mammograms that causes harm than you do detecting cancer at that stage, plus you go through a lot of false positives, a lot of biopsies done and testing done, don't lead anywhere, and most interestingly, if you have an aggressive cancer that is discovered in that 40 to 50 year old range, it isn't even clear that detection by mammogram saves lives because it's usually too late because it's a very aggressive form, which is why Angelina Jolie chose to undergo that double mastectomy. Rather than risk having to detect a cancer, you, another strategy would be to say, I'm going to wait. If I get cancer, I'll treat it. But those 40 to 50 year old cancers that appear even when detected are really nasty. So even if you detect them, it doesn't mean they haven't metastasized out already and caused death. Everybody follow that? So the evidence looks pretty good. And what was the response to this evidence? The president's wife said, keep getting tested. The Secretary of Health and Human Services said to Katie Couric, uh, I don't know, you know what the, the recommendation is all about. Uh, let's see if I have the uh, quote here. I'm not refuting the recommendations, but women should do what they've always done and talk to their doctors about healthcare decisions. Well, assumedly, their doctors have the report. <laughs> you don't have to talk to them. They read the same thing you did. So assume if you went in there and said, do I need a mammogram at 43 or every year, they would say, I read the US Task Force th thing, commissioned, by the way, by Secretary Sebelius, and I'm not going to do that. No, the secretary and the president his wife threw the report immediately under the bus because people cannot believe that it isn't good to get a test. Talking about virtue. If you tell women for 40 years it's virtuous to get tested and examine yourself and get every test imaginable, they start to believe you. And then you announce one day, oh, no, 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 no. The whole thing is too risky. It doesn't work. It's not detecting enough. It leads down a false path of false positives. You can't change that aircraft carrier's direction very readily. That ability to use evidence, nada. The impact on mammography in the US since the issuance of the report is nothing. Women are still getting annual mammograms. They talk to their doctors. Some of their doctors say, I do mammograms. I think you should have one. <laughs> Others say, I'm not sure what to do. It seems confusing. Some people say the recommendation wasn't well-grounded. I'm not here to debate whether the report was good or bad. 
I'm here to tell you, that's the best we're going to do. You can jump on the evidence or say they didn't have enough input from mammographers or whatever. I don't care. That tells me there is no shot at reining in cost by the use of evidence to guide decisions about what to pay for. Lest you think that isn't enough examples, let me tell you uh, two more. Proton beam. Anybody know about that? Very nice machine. Not quite an LVAD, but we could make this up about LVADs if we wanted to, the left ventricular cyst device. But I just happen to choose proton beam therapy because it sounds Star Trek-like. <laughs> Basically, a proton beam machine is a gigantic building the size of this place, uh, three floors down and one flight up. And the house rotates around you to shoot a uh, stream of protons to do what uh, traditionally we have tried to do with x-rays to kill tumors. So it's quite, quite an Im impressive technology. Um, unfortunately, a study of 12,000 patient records just published in the BMJ showed that men with prostate cancer treated with proton beam therapy had more complications than patients given conventional radiotherapy. They concluded there is no clear evidence of better effectiveness. The treatment probably has a downside, more side effects from current prostate treatment intervention, which isn't very good. Anyway, um, proton beam is unproven. At present, proton beam therapy for cancer, globally, there are now 39 of these facilities built. The US has 17, 19 more are being built now. They cost about $150 million per proton beam uh, construction. Two are coming to the Washington, D.C. area. Johns Hopkins and some other health system are trying to build them in D.C. They project $153 million to build these things. There is one 40 miles away in Maryland. <laughs> now, let me add, the fact is there's no evidence that any of them work. However, we can't say no to these technologies. This thing is so great, you put it up on a billboard. You drive down the uh, BQE and there's a big billboard that says, we got a proton beam machine and they don't. Where are you going to go? <laughs> so we can't say no. Provenge, another one of my favorite drugs, a vaccine for advanced prostate cancer. It's given to about 100,000 men a year. It costs $93,000 per treatment. The vaccine sometimes extends life as long as four months, usually two. Doesn't control pain or other symptoms. Uh, people covered it immediately. So what's the point of this uh, despairing thing? Partly it's to show you that economics is irrelevant in your life because here's the data. Here's all the information you could ever want. We understand fully what the costs are here. We understand what the outcomes are of mammography, Provenge, and proton beam therapy, and we are throwing a fortune of money into them. So the first idea was we can go down the road we're going down despite the demographics, despite the increased demand, despite the impact of prevention on how long we live, but we'll have to get the waste and fraud out. There's no way that's going to get us solvent. OK, let's use evidence. We'll collect evidence on what works and what doesn't work. We'll have panels, independent panels. They'll review the data. And that'll help us get to where we need to go. That isn't working either. We are not able to stand in the face of evidence and stop doing what we've done. We can't even resist the lure of building gigantic machines, not just small ones like LVADs, but big ones that um, cost a fortune. And let me tell you, when you build them, you will aim them at people. You will aim them at people, and you will charge for them. Uh, the estimate is that if you have one of these things, you can make profits in the 15 to 20 million per year just on prostate cancer patients. Not to get into who else has tumors that you might start aiming these things at. I was nervous at the University of Pennsylvania because we had one of these, an early one. And you were kind of nervous they were going to aim it at you if you just walked down the street near the place. Uh, I was really, mm. um, so what I hope I persuaded you of at this point is costs are out of control. Costs, given an aging society and a very expensive, we got to die in the hospital society, 
are going to get worse. There is no way to turn back that demographic over the next 20 to 30 years. People are in pipe dream land saying, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll be able to get where we want to go with cost. We'll weed out the fraud and the waste and the inefficiencies. Some turn to market mechanisms traditionally to do that. That's been great. <laughs> Others say, oh, let's be scientific. We'll put together panels. We'll assess the evidence. We'll know what's going on. That doesn't seem to have helped at all. So far, batting zero in terms of what's been turned down. Now, I said to you earlier, part of the problem is we also have a society that can't say no. And what do I mean by that? If you do uh, go to the bedside and ask families or patients what they want for their loved ones, what they want is for you to do something. Once you have entered into that hospital environment of the ICU, it is very difficult for anybody to turn down the offer of anything that might be of any sort of potential benefit to their loved one. What am I saying in blunt terms? Here's a number. It's your child in the neonatal ICU. There's a one in a billion chance that if I do X, your child will benefit. Live another three weeks, be more comfortable, you can pick the benefit. Should I do it? I'm asking you. How many want me to do it? You, nothing. <laughs> do it. What kind of parent? What, what kind of people are you? <laughs> of course you'll do it. You're a good parent. Good parents do things. They don't hang around saying, what does it cost? <laughs> and they certainly don't hang around saying, is this good for the gross national product? <laughs> um, would Krugman approve? You know, I mean, that's not. That isn't the discussion. You offered something of a benefit with long odds, and people feel they have to do it. Because part of our culture is you don't abandon people, you don't turn down potential benefit, a good person. Religions say you should help and sacrifice for your child. But the notion we have is that it's better to do something than nothing. We're not a culture that's very good at saying, yeah, in the face of a problem, don't do anything. We may, in fact, follow that as public policy frequently. <laughs> But it's not something we believe personally in our individual relationships as family, friends, partners, whatever. We think we ought to act. Yep. Um, we we um, already are abandoning people. Lester Thoreau, an economist, I'm sure you're familiar with, mm -hmm. said that no, we can uh, uh, maintain no, sorry. It's, it's and, and, and clarification. An industrial uh, economy by solely catering to the needs of the upper middle class. But we're already doing that. The, the New Deal programs are on the wane yeah. and, and all of that. And so, you know, your, your, your uh, complaints about costs, if we focus uh, the benefits Sir. from those costs just, ju just, just on the uh, upper middle class, uh, we'll probably survive. <laughs> so the argument, or the point is, not an argument, the point is there are many who are abandoned in the system. They don't get the full bore push uh, that we see for others. By the way, just to tap into something on the previous panel to reinforce something you just said, 71-year-old Lou Reed just got a liver transplant in the Midwest. That's right, yeah. Um, 71 years old? You know what a liver transplant costs? It's about $250,000 when it works Mantle. well. Mickey Mantle. That's an odd pairing, but yes, I <laughs> understand where you're going. Um, so here he is. He flies out there. They fly a, a donor in from somewhere, apparently, match them up, and... Uh, the media response is, well, that's nice. Good for Lou Reed. His wife is quoted in the paper saying, we went there because New York hospitals are dysfunctional. Having, since I work at one of them, I uh, noted that part closely. But I think what she meant was the wait lists are so long in New York that we had to basically jump the queue, spend the money, and go elsewhere, which you can do in the US. The rich have the ability to multiple list. If you, don't, if you don't like that case, that's what Steve Jobs did. Remember Steve Jobs got a transplant in Tennessee. He didn't live in Tennessee. What's he doing in Tennessee? He jetted to Tennessee and jumped the queue as a wealthy person to get access to a liver transplant there, which I only bring these examples up. I understand what you're saying. My only point was not about our willingness to 
handle the needs of the poor or poor children and so forth. It was just to say, morally, we often feel that we must do what is offered if we have the choice or the means to do it at the bedside. I, I understand what the public policy problems are very well. All right, so let me, we'll get into this. Somebody ought to be able to do a pretty adequate rebuttal here. But I was just building up to my crescendo now, which is this. We have no way to say no. We can't stop ourselves. We can't turn down anything. We are unable to ration. We can't even say the word. Somebody tries to bring up the topic of rationing. They're accused of uh, death panels. Um, it doesn't fly politically. Can't talk about it. I mean, I've been at many, many meetings, whereas the ethics guy sort of said, well, what do you want to really talk about is how to ration? Oh, no, 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 no. We're not talking about rationing. No, 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 no. And from what I told you in this talk, <laughs> that's very true. Not only are we talking about rationing, we're not even talking about declining things that don't work. So uh, at least in rationing, you presume that the livers work and you've got to distribute. Here, the proton beam machine, it's just cool, but it doesn't necessarily work. So we're not good at that. We can't ration. We have this drumbeat of cost because we're living longer. We have this drumbeat of cost because dying is very expensive and we haven't figured out any way to work our way out of that. I say the only thing we can do is stop or suspend research money. If it doesn't exist, we won't have to say no to it. If it doesn't exist, no one will try to market it to us. There's plenty of stuff we now have that we can't distribute fairly anyway. It's not like we need more stuff. The rich may need more stuff, but if you want to get into social justice, take the pot of money you've got and succeed in spreading out the current uh, benefits to all. You may ponder while I'm saying this, what exactly is covered in Obamacare? Liver transplants? Stem cell regenerative therapy? Proton beam? Well, part of the reason you're all looking so absolutely comatose there <laughs> is that... Um, but only partly. Only partly. But um, it's because we never got into that debate in the health reform discussion. All we said was we want to have access. There was a little talk about shifting coverage to more preventive things, but we don't know what the basic package is still. And the dream has been that we will use evidence-based medicine to guide the determination of the package, but I've just told you that we haven't been able to use it at all. So unless we suspend the goodies, and many of those goodies are like ProBench. They're marginal, tiny benefits. Three more months, $100,000. Two months of personalized medicine-based uh, drugs for you, but it's not like you're going to get better. It's just life extension at enormous cost. I don't see how we're ever going to be able to wrestle with this impending doom scenario. There's only one other option, and we haven't been able to take that either. It was put forward by my mentor some time ago and repeated in a number of books. Dan Callahan at the Hastings Center has long argued for age-based rationing, that at some point you are cut out of the high-tech stuff, the expensive stuff. The chance of that happening politically is somewhere between zero and a very big negative number, I think. <laughs> that isn't going to be our answer. Forget about the right or wrong of it. It just isn't going to fly either. So what else do we have? If we can't shut the machine down for a little bit, if you want to put it this way, till we catch up to it and distribute what we've got, there is no inclination to insist that the money we spend on mapping the brain or mapping the genome or funding anything will only be given if you promise to reduce cost. You might try that. It's never suggested, and I don't think the researchers will go for it. So my solution, grim as it may be, and as tongue-in-cheek as it might be, is what else can we do but to shut down the research pipeline? It's the only way we can go because we can't say no. We're unable to turn down on evidence, on age, on moral merit. We can't even utter the word rationing. The only hope we have is to stop funding for a while Otherwise, I don't think we're going to be able to handle the cost implications in an aging society that only knows how to die at a very expensive rate. <laughs> um, so, 
So since we don't have a debate, we're going to rely on you to give arguments why that might not be a good idea. In a minute, I have a few other questions to ask you, but I actually want to go to you, all of you first. I mean, uh, you heard it. Where is the problem in this argument? We heard from you just, well, let me see if some other people first and then, okay. Uh, we heard from you a second ago too. Is there anybody else? Okay, way in the back. Jack. Jack. Uh, oh, do you have it? You, do you have a microphone there? I can't, I see. Way in the back. <laughs> and then we're gonna come, after that we're gonna come to there because that'll be a good run for Jack too. Come on Jack, run. And the t and data on the chronic disease and how that's costing, especially in relationship to that last six months of life cost. Because the chronic diseasers who then die and rack up a lot of costs in that last six months of life, how much did they cost yeah. before? I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Is that coming through? I think the research community shut me off. So um, I don't know the answer to that question, but I believe that uh, one type of expenditure is very telling. The end-stage renal disease program in the US, which started back in 76, initial expenditure for that program was about, in its first year, $600 million. Anybody want to guess what the current, you may know, current estimate, current expenditure for kidney dialysis in the US? <laughs> about $8 billion. And it's very hard to die in the United States without a round of dialysis. So on your chronic disease model, most people who were in the last six months who are undergoing organ failure would include their kidneys. You find them going to dialysis. I used to get into fights, I still do, I guess, with uh, oncologists who kept referring people in their final days to nephrology for dialysis. And you sort of say, but they're dying. What are we doing that for? Another challenge, just in the spirit of chronic illness cost, take something simple. You know, we still do vitals on everybody who we've decided we should allow to die. And it costs a fair chunk of change. And the interesting thing is that when you've allowed somebody to die by removing all medical care, their vitals are poor. <laughs> Jack, Jack, hurry up, down here. Were you, uh, did you wanna, no, 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 no you, 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 yeah. The do doctor, yeah, okay. Hi. Um, so would you stop research on new weapon systems also? <laughs> now they kill people effectively. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, what, one thing is um, your, your proposal, then, then you'd have private, you'd have private funding of research. And so some of these things would maybe increase disparities and not, you know, not, not really eliminate them. Yeah, the, you know, the, I, I understand that. Was that back? Yeah. Okay, kick back on. Okay, sorry, how's that? You can see why I hate technology. <laughs> um, so, uh, one of the problems with the, you know, my proposal, such as it is, don't worry, the chance of my proposal happening is not big. A um, little less than our stopping mam mammography, I suspect. Um, so uh, if you look out there at the, the uh, private side spending, people might say, well, then they're just going to chase the you know, drugs that help the rich and so on. In fact, that is what happens anyway now. So you got the NIH, and we pay for that as public funding, but then we hand off the research over to the pharma industry or bio or device and they chased the market. So we had to invent an orphan drug program for the rare diseases and, you know, diseases of poverty, it's tough to really build private sector interest in those. So uh, to some extent, we're watching that happen a little bit now in, in the way that our money goes. And if you really want to get irritated from our conference today, get this. You pay your tax money for the NIH portion of public funding. Then the drug company comes along, takes the basic discoveries, translational research, and you get to pay for it again in a higher price. That's a good system. I like that. That's, I mean, I know philosophy's backward, but we got to come up with something like that for funding. Uh, except for, except for no, I, no, I'm not on any. <laughs> <laughs> So you know what I mean? You're getting double charged. You wind up having public money underwrite the basic research that they don't do, and then you're charged again. 
Except for the hedge fund managers who don't get charged twice because that would be charging them twice, you know. Yeah, right. Okay. No, no, no capital gains. No capital uh, gains. We have uh, in our midst a, a somebody who actually does uh, torture mice for a living. Ah, and there we go. <laughs> yeah, full disclosure, my, um, my salary comes from the NIH. <laughs> so imagine we shut down research and, and I, I'm out of a job. All in favor. <laughs> <laughs> You've given us all these reasons why, under the current conditions, we're spiraling out of control. We can't deal with fraud. We can't deal with waste. Evidence-based medicine is not going to get us out of the water, nor rationing, for various political reasons. What you haven't explained to us is, now that we've shut down research, how those problems are going to go away and how we're ultimately not going to spiral out of control. I don't see how your proposal actually solves the problem that you're diagnosing. Well, part of the problem is every year we get another Provenge or every year we get another Herceptin or whatever you know the drug is or the device or the LVAD or whatever. So my idea here is we'll slow down the uh, continued entry of new and expensive products and I forecast due to personalized medicine, uh, more expensive things coming if we don't get on top of this problem and get you out of the workforce. So, um, By the way, you then die, and that saves us money, too. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess the argument is slow down the new and expensive stuff over the next 10 to 20 years. Continue to, you're going to face these challenges, but at least you've started to, and you start to bend the curve. But then maybe you should modify your your position, which is that maybe shutting down research will result in this problem being less exacerbated, but it's certainly not going to solve it. Okay, I, I'll cons uh, that. <laughs> I must make a concession. If you looked at the demographics, and you looked at the cost of dying, and you said we're not denting that much, despite all the good efforts of advanced directive people and you know conversations in the community, it's not denting a lot, and we still have more and more people entering into the elderly ranks, mine is not a complete solution to those cost problems. But it still can generate a bit of enthusiasm, right? I mean, it's taking out some segment of cost explosion. may not get us uh, everywhere we need to be, um, but it will help. I would concede that point. Does anybody else want to push back? Like, how about over here, this man here? I have a question. In various areas of, of the country, there, there are artificial price controls, not to talk about medicine, but in municipalities where they're running into financial trouble, you get temporary financial control boards. And in wartime, there's been you know, product controls and things like that uh, back before I was born. Mm -hmm. um, has there been any consideration to utilizing some kind of uh, temporary uh, price control mechanism rather than putting a lid on research? I love your idea, and in fact, the temporary consideration given was the creation of Medicare Part D, the extension of drug coverage to the elderly, a bigger uh, set of uh, benefits granted, which explicitly prohibited both price limits and bargaining as a group to get cheaper prices. Great. Well, I'm, you know, so uh, wonderful. There is a system right in front of our faces that does what you're talking about, and it's called the VA. And the VA has fixed prices and buys as a large-scale purchaser. It doesn't have everything in the formula, and I don't want to give you your job back. But if we could at least move down the road of saying, hey, how about we have more group purchasing on some of this stuff, drive the prices down, and the VA prices, I can tell you, are considerably less, DOD too, and it's military hospitals spends far less on drugs, devices, vaccines. There's the example, I think we should take it. I don't really want him unemployed. So um, that would work. But you know, everything in Congress has been, let the market solve it. And the market has led to the waste and the inefficiency and the skyrocketing prices. We haven't had a hearing in, on prices of anything since I can, I don't know, I don't remember ever seeing a congressional hearing on prices. Time Magazine did a pretty good popular discussion recently on the high, inexplicably high prices of things, and people moaned about it a little, but didn't see any hearing. So I'm for, you know, I, I'm on board. I think that's a way to go. 
There's a system that does it. By the way, for those of you who don't know this, the VA happens to be the biggest nationalized, socialized medicine system in the world. It's bigger than the NHS. So when you hear a congressman say, I want government out of health care, you ask him when he's closing the VA in this <laughs> neighborhood. By the way, there, uh, um, I'm tr trying to remember uh, the name. There's a uh, company now that is doing kind of what the Time Magazine article did, which is for any procedure you're about to have, you can go online and find out all the different, what's the name of that company? Clinical yeah, Trials, what? clinicaltrials.gov. Clinical Trials, got, uh, there's also a private company that, that yeah. will, will take you, if you have to get a mammogram, you can find out what the different, char oh. which are different prices for mammograms within 50 yes. miles of where you live. And it turns out it's, Varies all of them ver <laughs> varies all over the place, and that will happen. There'll be more of that too. But we still haven't uh, answered good. I, give it a good. I, I want to okay. Uh, Sharon, make a Sharon gets to answer. As a speaker, I uh, butt in here. So I I, I really like your um, provocation. It's great to think with. It's really good for us. Um, you know, Diane Meyer this morning was talking about how there needs to be a citizen for those of you who are a citizen response. That there needs to be a public lobby to change health care because obviously Congress isn't doing it and she talked about the lobbying force of pharma and device and the hospital industry itself, mm -hmm. et cetera. So the only um, you know, wonderful pushback to, to what you are uh, describing to us that I can think of has been, maybe everybody saw it, I can't think of the name of two physicians, but one, two oncologists, one at Sloan Kettering, one somewhere else. They just wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times. It was maybe oh, three, four, six months ago, saying, prevent, I believe it was Prevenge, otherwise it was some other drug. This drug is outrageously expensive and we refuse to use it on our cancer patients. Forget it, we're using, and besides which, it doesn't work any, any better or only marginally better than the drug that had been on the market and tested and evidence-based before. So the hell with you, we're not using this drug. That started a revolution doctors in the rest of the country have followed suit and they're no longer using the drug. So the citizen revolt in this case was two outspoken MDs, which is great. So I think one of the things maybe we all should do is not because they're the front lines, they have the authority to prescribe, they're the ones who are saying you need the proton beam, would be for all, one intervention for all of us is to urge our MDs to um, push back. I like that, and I think part of the notion that we might have to come to grips with as patients is the notion that good advocacy does not mean getting us the marginal, perhaps not uh, comfortable, short-term extension of life. There's certainly some discussion that if you want to do those things, if you want to keep your dad in the ICU in a permanent vegetative state, maybe you should have more out-of-pocket expense. I can think of some ways to drive price in more reasonable directions. And I might add, since that was a happy note, <laughs> in the state and, of and, and I just know that uh, Mr. and Mrs. Kaplan's little boy never does happy <laughs> notes. <laughs> so not for long. So the uh, state of Georgia just passed a law urged by the Georgia Medical Association that says when you have standards issued by uh, evidence-based medicine groups like the United States Task Force. These will not be admissible in courts relative to malpractice. Now, think about that. What they're saying is, if you get a guideline and it says this is enough, you're doing enough, you can't use that to defend yourself against the malpractice. Because I know where the, tr where the problem's gonna be for the ProVeg guy. Some lawyer's gonna show up and say, hey, you didn't offer four more months to my dad, and he would have been there for the wedding, and I ain't happy about it, and you had a duty to at least put it on the table. It seems to me if you also want to rein in cost and price somewhat, you'd want to say it is a safe harbor to go to these guidelines and say if I do that, at least that's minimally adequate. But weirdly, it, it, they just passed a law that went completely in the other direction, which I don't understand. That was the bad news part. So, But I think there are ways maybe you could tie the evidence to something we all long for, which is malpractice reform. It's interesting you say that. Uh, when we were doing our event about solitary confinement a few uh, mon months ago, it turned out that the state that was really doing great work on solitary confinement was uh, that had released 85% of their people in solitary confinement was Mississippi. 
And so I propose that the slogan for the people trying to do it in New York is, can we be at least as good as Mississippi, you know? Uh, maybe can we be at least as good as Georgia? Um, let's see over here. Uh, Arthur, I really like your, your proposal. Uh, not because I think it's practical, but because I think it is provocative. And, um, and I think innovative thinking is, is really important uh, to find us a way out of this. In terms of pushback, the problem is that it, it essentially embodies the same um, problems that you, I think, correctly reject, which is the concept of um, not allowing something it's not taking it away, but in a sense it is taking away uh, something that I think in our society we expect technology to bail us out. And to take the technology away uh, down the road is in essence saying you're, we're not going to let you have that. So I think that that's the uh, political problem there, um, as you know. Um, it is interesting, though, that the cost curve actually has bent the last couple of years, and no one uh, really knows the reason why. I think um, the article that came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association a couple of months back that showed this dramatic increase over the last 10 years of the use of hospice, it basically doubled, uh, which surprised everybody. Um, basically shows that there, there is a phenomenon that's going on right now that I don't, I don't think we even recognize it, of instability in the medical care system um, that provides an opportunity. And when people are off balance, they're willing to move in different directions. Um, and the concept that we're going to do what people actually want done, which is, in fact, most of the time, less, they don't want these interventions for short periods of time that involve often a lot of expense, a lot of pain, uh, a lot of disability. Um, but the key is they, they want to understand that. And I think there is a huge public demand that is, uh, it's almost a pent up anger that they want the information, they, they don't want the double speak in medical ease, and that may be the thing that pushes us in that direction. Could be. Um, there has been a bending, and I, I mentioned too the drug expenditure dropped a lot this past year, uh, and I think people were a little surprised. And to give credit, I think the Obama health reform has driven some savings out of Medicare uh, that it captured, and that's been good. And when you pool more broadly, you're going to capture some savings just by having everybody in so that they're not at the ER, so to speak. So that's good. On the other hand, you know, that inevitable march toward um, aging and, and managing a lot more people dying, uh, even if 20% of them rather than 10 pick hospice, you still get a lot more uh, in the denominator who could wind up in the more intense settings. Um, I think if we're going to do this, there's another place I want to tweak a button. And I don't know if Diane Meyer said anything about this. I didn't get a chance to hear her. But something I hear when I wander the floors uh, watching uh, end of life care stuff. It's not uncommon for somebody to say to me, I have to suffer before I die because I wasn't a good person, so you give me all the uh, interventions you've got. People have very symbolic views of how they die. They know how Jesus died, they know what it means to make up for sin or bad behavior, and they think, you want to run another round of chemo on me? I merit that. There's another version of that, which is the five children of which one of the children was was not around for the last 15 years and shows up and says, do, do everything, do everything. They're common. Yeah. In the East Coast, we call them flew in from Sacramento, and I don't know what they call them on the West Coast, but they're, <laughs> it's the same, flew in from New York, but it's the same person, probably flying around all the time, alleging <laughs> to be... Think of his frequent flyer friend, miles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the other side of this is I've heard people say, I have to accept end-of-life aggressive intervention. They don't want people to think of me as a coward. So when I'm telling you about uh, symbolism or culture, some in the previous panel, I was smiling a little bit because, you know, the uh, our panelists said not not everything has to do with reason and rationality. How we die, it's very much tied into our feelings about religion, suffering, exculpation, being virtuous to others, and that sort of thing. And that can cost a lot of money, 
if there's a lot of technology hanging on the end of uh, those mm -hmm. wishes. So that needs some work too. Over here. Yeah, I want to pick up on uh, two points ago, something that was said across the room about how you know when a test or treatment is useless. And you haven't mentioned the Choosing Wisely campaign. And you can go to a website called choosingwisely.org. And nine special medical special specialties, ha uh, the doctors in each have been uh, told to come up with the five top useless tests or treatments in their respective fields. And you'd be surprised. Uh, one example is uh, the primary care doctors. Uh, one of their five is the routine blood test. It's worth going there. <laughs> uh, actually, I even think the routine yearly physical pops yeah. up. Oh, there yeah, that's, for that's definitely GPs. been on I mean, the list. GPs, I mean, for people. Not, on, on, not on this list, though. I don't think it is on this particular oh, list. But one? you're absolutely right. There's no evidence for yeah. it. Yeah. So um, <laughs> at least if you're under. 50, I think it is. So um, I, I am aware of that movement. I think it's interesting because it ties back to points that have been made about uh, trying to encourage the uh, your physician or uh, physicians to be more prudent, to be aware of, uh, you know, there are things out there that aren't done. But those are really driven in America by litigation worries. So, I, I was going to ask, why don't you have uh, Instead of your theory about getting rid of all the uh, scientists, scientists, kill the lawyers. yeah, yeah, why don't you go to the Shakespeare solution? <laughs> kill, kill the lawyers, and, and and what would that do? It would help a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not one, so uh, it would do a lot of good. There's clearly um, great resistance on the part of many physicians to not order tests and not do things that they might feel that they're going to be held to account. If you look, we're doing a study right now of radiologists and what they tell <coughs> physicians about their findings when they see incidental things, not the thing they were looking for. And it's completely driven by legal concern. They just sort of say, well, can't rule out cancer. Now, what that means to the primary care doc is I better be running a lot more tests if this person might have cancer. What it meant to the radiologist is there's no chance in hell they have cancer, but I'm not saying that little ground glass opaque thing I saw, I'm not gonna say it's nothing, because what if it was something? So I better say, can't rule out. So we have work to do in terms of really shifting the litigation drive in unnecessary testing, which does account for not huge chunks of our expenditure, but it's, it's, some, it's probably on the order of Suit. Yeah, so uh, Mike, that's what I was trying to say that. before. <laughs> she said you word. might want to add that you'd be <laughs> safe if you didn't do things. And what I want to get us to agree to is we've been trying, I've been trying, for many years to get malpractice reform done. It's something that has to happen, by the way, at the state level. So it's very difficult. State legislatures are really run by lawyers. A lot of them are litigators. They don't really want to take away that opportunity for themselves. And to be fair, the only way we have in the current system to weed out bad guys is to sue them. It's not an efficient way to do it, and it doesn't really get a lot of the bad apples out, but it's the only thing you've got. So a Ralph Nader will say, well, I'm not going to give up on malpractice litigation if you're not going to give me something else. And so you, I, I understand that view. But if we have standards, and they're set up empirically, or they're set up by the professional associations, that should be safe harbor for every doctor against malpractice. So that's what I was trying to say before. We need to link evidence-based medicine, give it teeth. The teeth it needs to really work better is to say, this is your defense. That would avoid having to shut down the NIH for a while. Way in the back. Uh, is there ever been any thought on um, patient-driven uh, prevention of malpractice claims, in other words, waivers going in that the patients who are well-informed and educated and understanding their situation, not people being rushed to sign a piece of mm -hmm. paper as they go into surgery, but thoughtful, advanced consent. Every year, all 11 of those people, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm in the informed consent business. I come from a field that loves informed consent, that fosters autonomy. I'm also, sadly, an ethicist that trudges around 
healthcare facilities and watches people do informed consent, and it's pretty tough to do. So there aren't a lot of those folks. Normally, it's my baby's born prematurely. What do you think I should do? Or you know, my dad is very sick. I don't want to feel guilty. Would you tell me you know what you think we ought to do? So informed consent or the educated consumer. It's one of my gripes about the market solutions to healthcare. The consumers are not very empowered, and they are driven by many, many other values and notions in the culture about what a good person does or a good husband does or a good parent does. That said, one thing we could do, which we don't, is shift away from an informed consent model to a model where we quiz the patient or the family and record comprehension. In other words, lawyers like sign documents. I like something that says, do you understand? And I'm going to ask you four or five questions to make sure that you did. If we could move in that direction, I think you'd get more of what you're suggesting. But right now, it's, it's not often. Not often. Um, I, uh, we're we're going to come to a stop now in a second. But, but just, uh, I mean, we've, we've, the conversation has kind of moved in that direction. But if we can kind of. Uh, uh, gingerly pull your tongue out of your cheek. Um, you sure were depressing before. Um, <laughs> I mean, what what do you think could be done to uh, effectively? I mean, uh, Mr. Swift, do you really want to eat all those children? <laughs> I, I think there are four or five things we could do uh, to avoid this, you know, foregoing of better benefits, which, you know. I, I, uh, I had a kidney stone removed five or six years ago. It was done laparoscopically. It wasn't done by major surgery going into my back. I get some of the benefits that technology can bring firsthand. I see them in the hospital all the time. I see us doing uh, things with far less intervention. I, some of those preventive drugs are good, even though I sneered that they would save us money in the long run. They give us more health, so I'm not. That's quality of life counts with me. I think four or five things I would do. One, I think we have to really start to link, give teeth to these uh, evidence-based medicine committees and groups to say they are going to guide reimbursement policy for Medicare and Medicaid. Don't pass muster there, can't pay. You want it, copay. So I think we ought to use a little bit more copay to the person who says, I still want this, but it's not in the benefits package. Um, it's not because I really am a believer that the market is going to make us all prudent consumers, but it's not fair to burden people who want to do things marginal or outside the range uh, to ask everybody to pay for that. I think second thing I'd do is I'd link the existence of standards and guidelines, whether they're professional society or um, issued by independent government panels, to uh, relief from malpractice. It is your defense. You ought to be able to say. I did what the national, what the obstetrician said I should do, and I'm sorry the baby had problems, but it, I did everything and it's documented. You can't sue me, or I mean, you can sue me, but you can't, I can bring this in as my defense. That would help get rid of some of the uh, real litigation. Third thing I think we could do out there these days is we probably need uh, to rethink or teach advocacy differently to our doctors and nurses. Being a good advocate doesn't mean getting every marginal benefit. It means getting prudent benefits. It means using your resources wisely and stewarding them. What, what is, explain what advocacy means, I'm sorry. So advocacy right now means if I come to the bedside and I'm your doc, I'm gonna get every resource I can for you, no matter how costly or marginal, that's what a good advocate does. I don't think that's the right ethical notion of advocacy. You probably wanna say I come to your bedside and I get what's reasonably useful to you, uh, but I don't feel a duty that I have to offer every, you know, I don't have to say, well, there's a baboon heart transplant, and I saw that in Poland they did a face transplant, but, you know, I mean, it's sort of, uh, you, 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 advocacy, advocacy can be done well without feeling that there's nothing uh, that shouldn't be offered, so to speak, and I think we have put that ethical norm into how we expect people to act at the bedside. Maybe the last thing is to go back and really let's look at the prices. We talked about that earlier, but they're out of control. They're inexplicable. They're all over the place. They make no sense. That's clearly a big element of cost. We need some accountability, and I think the Obamacare reforms 
We want to see more group purchasing. We want to see more ability to drive prices down that way. But I'd like to hear more price justification. Why is this $2,000 here and $5,000 there? There's, we have a whole uh, you know, parade of economists. Where are these people? I mean, you know, it's clear that there's been a disconnect from prices to uh, what the value of the product is. And at a time when we're thinking about withholding resources from poor people or not giving marginal benefits to people, we ought to at least ask, why is this price what it is? So those would be some things. So, and, and one that I would add to that list would be, what will be the subject later on today, which is rethinking how we die. Oh, yeah. And, and. Or where we die. Where, where we die, how we die, what the good death might be. So listen, we're going to take a break. Go get something to eat. Uh, and, uh, and when you come back, if you have never heard Mike Daisy, uh, I urge you to come back. He'll be here at 6.30. He will give one of his monologues. They're truly astonishing. Uh, and after that, we're going to open up. We're going to have a conversation. Some of the people we've heard from already will be back up here. And we're just going to have a conversation among ourselves about what a good death might look like. So thank you so much. And thank you. And give our best to your parents. <laughs>